Welcome to another CMC podcast. Today, we're going to dive into the uh, highly specialized uh, kind of sub-discipline of technical rescue, cave rescue. And uh, to tell us a, a lot more about uh, the subject, we have four guests. So starting out, we have uh, Tim White. So Tim, can you say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hello. My name is Tim White. Like you said, uh, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've been involved in cave rescue since 1990. Been a recreational caver since uh, college years in the in the 80s started uh, rock climbing and in caving i lived uh, near huntsville alabama and that's where i got my my start uh huntsville alabama actually has the headquarters of the national speleological society that's the national caving organization here in the u.s so uh, it was just kind of a a natural occurrence for me to get involved in that recreational side of caving and uh, the tennessee alabama georgia area that tri-state region is known by the acronym of tag and uh, it has more deep vertical uh, shaft caves and caves developed along a vertical fault system than anywhere in the U.S. So it's a real popular caving area. Oh, excellent. Thanks. So also joining us, we have Andy Armstrong. Andy. Hi there. I live in Heber City, Utah, and I've been here for about 13 years, living in the western U.S. about the last 20 years. Actually grew up in Tennessee closer to where Tim is from. And uh, I've just found myself kind of gravitating towards expedition caving, either camping underground or backpacking into an area, setting up a base camp and exploring some of the really long, amazing caves that we have in the Western US. And I've been involved with cave rescue. My first cave rescue was when I was in Boy Scouts in Tennessee and we were camped in Cumberland Caverns. And my friend and I had to go leave the cave to call a uh, search for uh, another uh, person that had wandered off in the night in the cave. And I uh, got involved with the NCRC, the National Cave Rescue Commission uh, in, in 2006. And that's a commission of the National Speleological Society that Tim mentioned. And with them, I've learned a ton about the challenges of rescue underground and became an instructor for them. and have helped to develop uh, our small party assisted rescue curriculum where we teach uh, cavers and others the skills to to uh, deal with medical and other emergencies underground and in some cases perform their their own rescue. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Carrie Bull. Uh, my name is Carrie Bull and I work for Austin Fire Department. I'm a specialist in the Special Operations Department. Uh, we are responsible for all the technical rescue in our area. So everything that's water, hazmat, rope related, and cave rescue falls under that. Um, the first time I went into a cave was for cave rescue training. And then I liked it so much that I took as many classes as I could. I joined my local cave club. I am lucky enough to get to go caving recreationally or helping out with exploration or um, helping others explore. Um, underwater. And uh, I became a cave rescue instructor about three years ago, and I now also serve on our education committee. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Kerry. And uh, lastly, joining us today, uh, we have uh, Justin Wheaton. Justin. Uh, hey, Doug. Yep. My name is Justin. I'm from Southern California. I'm the current commander of the San Bernardino County Cave and Technical Rescue Team um, under, under the auspice of the sheriff. Uh, our mission here is a little bit different. We are a cave rescue team. We are an NCRC team, all that good stuff. Um, but in Southern California and in San Bernardino County, we have a lot of mines, um, over 40,000 abandoned mines just in San Bernardino alone. Um, so a little bit different mission profile, but, but a lot of the same, same conversations to be had. Uh, I'm a, a mountaineer, uh, alpinist. I do a lot of canyoneering and stuff as well. And that was kind of my gateway into caving. Um, and similar to Carrie, my, my experience is mostly formed from joining a cave rescue team. Excellent. And I guess one little uh, uh, interesting fact too that you know, in our pre-talk you mentioned, uh, talk about the size of San Bernardino County. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's actually nine states that are smaller than San Bernardino County. It's the largest county in the entire country. Uh, definitely not the uh, the small counties that many of us are used to in our respective states. So, uh, kind of leave some groundwork for some of the discussion here later the, later during the podcast. So, uh, 
So we have people from literally four uh, very different regions of the country. And uh, with that, uh, you know, one would assume different types of caves. So uh, we'll have each of you, if you don't mind, kind of talk about, you know, some of the uh, the different types of caves you have in your area and the, and the challenges that come with those. So, Tim, if you want to start us off. Yeah, happy to. As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, the, 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 ta- the caves in the southeast region, uh, the southeastern region of the U.S., uh, primarily the heart of the southeastern region is Tag, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia. And uh, we're in the foothills of the Appalachians. Uh, one reason that uh, so one reason that the caves exist here, they're, they're, all, they're all made of limestone, uh, is the sandstone cap. So the area of Tennessee, northern Georgia, north Alabama, especially around Chattanooga, which is kind of the heart of, of the Tag region, uh, is, is really well known for steep sandstone rock climbing. But that sandstone cap over uh, the uh, water, uh, uh, over the limestone that's susceptible to erosion due to water is what's protected the limestone from eroding away. But it's also that sandstone cap is what uh, helped create the caves. So a uh, little, little bit of geology. Uh, as rainwater seeps through the ground, it picks up a carbon molecule. So it becomes the water is a, is a lightly carbonic acid. So that's what uh, erodes the, the limestone away. And a lot of the caves in this region how, are developed along a vertical fault line in that limestone. So they create deep vertical shafts uh, or what we refer to as pits. Um, just a little, a little bit of history that uh, current, all the current uh, uh, static current mantle rope that we use in technical rescue kind of had its development and origin uh, in this tag region. It was uh, cavers making rope for cavers to do cave exploration. So uh, still a real, real early infancy. But we don't realize that how uh, technical rescue is is really you know, only been around uh, since. The 60s, and that's when a lot of the cave exploration uh, became popular in, in the Tag region. And so the caves here, you learn to be a vertical caver really quick. Excellent. So I, I would imagine, and that, that kind of comes with its own specific, specific sets of hazards and challenges, then. Absolutely does. Ben, it's a much more vertical environment, yeah. Now, are your caves, are they, are they still fairly wet caves, or are they dry, or a combination? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of both. Um, a lot of the a lot of the pits actually have still have active waterfalls pouring off into them. Uh, there's one particular cave uh, in North Georgia in Pigeon Mountain uh, has a 586 foot deep pit that you can descend, travel over a mile of underground cave passage, and ascend out the other side of the mountain uh, out of another deep vertical shaft. And both of these pits have active waterfalls pouring off into them year round. That definitely adds to some challenges. So I would assume, yeah, like you said, you, you get very good at uh, working in that vertical environment, uh, especially good at ascending, I would imagine. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> so, well, thanks. And then uh, Andy, what about in your region? Uh, I've been fortunate to cave in a lot of different environments. Uh, these days, I stay pretty active down in Grand Canyon where the caves are fairly dry and actually pretty horizontal. They're just extremely vertical to get to the caves. Um, here in Utah, just right up the road from where I live, there's caves with permanent ice and glaciers underground. And then I could drive two hours the other direction to some uh, old hydrothermal caves that are in the 70s. Um, so in this region of the Rocky Mountains, it's really all about variety. And for the last several years, I've uh, been privileged to serve as the Rocky Mountain Regional Coordinator for the National Cave Rescue Commission, helping to foster trainings, but also build relationships with rescue teams across the region. And that region has everything from lava tubes in Idaho to some of the really deep exploration that's going on in the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Montana, 21 miles from a trailhead. And then uh, the Black Hills in South Dakota, where we've got two of the world's longest caves, uh, Wind Cave and Jewel Cave, each over 150 miles long uh, with active exploration there. And so the challenge for us in this area is there's a lot of different types of things going on. And as Tim mentioned, geology plays a large role in it, whereas in the eastern U.S., a lot of 
the vertical caving areas are actually in horizontal limestone, which lends itself to rigging once at the top and having a rope that goes all the way to the bottom. And that's had ramifications in how ropes are built and how caves are rigged and how techniques are, are uh, thought up. Um, here in the Western US, we have lots of areas of limestone, but they're scattered across hundreds of mountain ranges. And the limestone tends to be uplifted at different angles. And so the style of caves and, and the actual morphology of the caves is more similar to what you'd find in Europe, where you might be uh, rappelling down a vertical fissure where you have to have multiple anchor points and different maneuvers to move not only vertical, but horizontally down through these obstacles. Uh, so one thing that's interesting to me is how different techniques and different gear originates in different areas. And that often has to do with geology. And then as we take these different ideas from different places, in some cases, those ideas can work together. Uh, and in some areas we have to just uh, use one certain style and, and uh, abandon other techniques based on our situation. And I'm, I'm guessing with all those transfers over both vertically and horizontally too, you guys are, are definitely uh, expert at edge pro. Yeah. And, that, and that's an interesting, uh, you know, sidebar to that discussion is uh, if you're going to rig at the top and have the rope hang completely free, it might make sense to have edge pro or edge pad right on that one edge. But if the shape of the pit is such that the rope would touch multiple places, it's probably better to use more of a European style technique where the rope uh, never touches the rock at all. And each place that it would, you add um, some rigging that would keep it suspended in midair. And those deviations and rebelays uh, cause for a different type of uh, single rope technique kit, uh, the equipment that you use, and also the techniques that you use to negotiate those obstacles. Yeah, some very unique challenges there. So, Kerry, what about in your region? So, I'm actually from the South Central region um, for the NCRC split up, which is Arkansas, Louisiana, Kansas, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Texas. And there's a note on here about Mexico rescue only. Um, and a lot of our uh, cave club, our grotto members, uh, do a lot of expedition work down in Mexico. For the fire department, the caves I most have to worry about are the ones actually in Austin. And we have hundreds of caves in Austin, but a lot of them can be broken up into two very vague categories. And hopefully I won't get in too much trouble from the cavers about this, but the guys at work like to say that they're either small and crawly or they're like vertical and just a hole in the ground. Um, so we have a few vertical pits, not to the scale of tag, but, um, you know, 65 feet down is a pretty big one for us. Um, there's a few other caves that we don't have as much access to for um, either uh, endangered species protection or for um, like research purposes. Um, and they are a little bit deeper, but our hazards tend to be that our caves are in the grand scheme of things pretty warm. So a hazard for our rescues have to rescuers have to remember is that they're going to get pretty hot in there and they need to be self-sustainable in a different way, maybe than those glacier caves that Andy was talking about um, or caves with glaciers in them. We, a lot of times tend to have bad air. We can have really high CO2 levels in our caves. And so we just have to be really careful about the environment that we're going into. And also a lot of our training in Texas, especially takes place in the winter times because the air tends to be a little bit better. And as it's 80 degrees here today, you can tell that sometimes that, that weather on the outside will affect the temperature on the inside because we're not getting the air exchange that we would if we had really cold winters. The other sort of rescuer hazard we have here is the specialized training for it. Most of the guys, just like me, had never been into a cave before they go into they do something for cave rescue. And so for us, a lot of it is how do you move through this cave? I hear that a lot. Or how am I supposed to do this? Or heck no, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and so uh, we do some training about not just how to move a patient through a cave, but how to move ourselves through the cave as well. Well, yeah, it would seem like a lot of this is like confined space on steroids or you know, we're used to going to like in a, in, a, in a confined space world. We're going used to going into uh, like an industrial, like a vessel or a boiler, or, you know, a tank or something like that, where there's a few you know, difficult spots to get through, but you have miles of difficult spots to get through. So maybe like a mile in Austin. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't, my R's are not quite at the same scope in Austin. We do have a couple of, and in, in the larger region, there are much bigger caves um, in South Texas, um, in Arkansas. Uh, even there's a couple, even, you know, outside of Texas, uh, just the immediate Austin area. Um, some of those have been turned into show caves. Um, and so they have a different set of problems that go along with that. Okay. Thank you. And then Justin, what about the, what about on the far, uh, on the far West coast? What do you, what do you guys have to deal with? Uh, yeah. So, so I kind of already mentioned that our, our mission profile might be a little bit different. However, we do have some caves. Uh, we were founded for a cave called Mitchell caverns out here in San Bernardino County, uh, which is a vertical limestone pit cave. Um, accessed very similarly to what, what, what Andy was describing, multiple drops, multiple pitches to access the bottom of the cave. Uh, we also have a lot of Talus Cave, which is a little different than the other regions, uh, which is caves that are made from large boulders and rocks that water has passed through and created passages. Um, so that's another unique um, uh, cave formation we have out here. Uh, it could also be in granite, harder rocks, and things like that. Um, but the the majority of our responses are to mines. Uh, mines are not caves. Uh, they are made by men and carry a lot more different hazards than caves alone. A um, lot of crossover, very similar uh, access, mapping, communication techniques that you'd see in the other caves. Um, however, we do have a lot more of the more uh, traditional confined space hazards as well. We have bad atmospheres. Um, we have um, hazardous materials, uh, things like that, that were used for, for mining or leaching in the mines and stuff that was left behind hundreds of years ago, undetonated explosives, things like that, that, that we deal with as well, um, as well as the structural side of the mine, uh, something that a man made rather than nature. Uh, we're always evaluating the structural integrity of a mine. Um, and that's another uh, a big piece of the puzzle for us out here. Um, we cover a very large area in San Bernardino alone, let alone the rest of the state. Uh, and we have a lot of mines, uh, as well as a lot of vertical pits, too. We have prospect mines and, and shafts that we've been down 700 plus feet um, vertically uh, that are man-made. So, so similar, similar challenges, but but some additional hazards as well. Well, and then what about like air quality? Carrie mentioned they have some air quality issues. I would imagine you guys have got some potential for some bad air too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that, that sets the mines apart a little bit. Uh, depending on the mine and when it was made and kind of the, the overall makeup of it, they are designed to ventilate. So some mines do naturally ventilate and provide good air through them. Uh, others do not. And a lot of these pits... Um, could have had burns inside them. I, I mentioned hazardous materials and stuff that could be left behind in mines as well. Uh, so monitoring air and being prepared with rescue breathers or being able to enter a mine with a SCBA system or a, a biopack or rebreather system is something that we're, we're constantly training for and preparing for as well. Yeah, definitely add some, some challenges uh, to getting through some tight spots when you're wearing a biopack, huh? Yeah, that's, it's not easy. <laughs> Can't yeah. see anything. Don't fit through anything. Yeah, just wonderful, huh? <laughs> so, so kind of in our pre-conversation too, we uh, and one of the things I know we discussed that was uh, a huge challenge for you guys was just simple comms, just communicating, you know, underground, you know, within you know, the teams underground or also to the surface. So, you know, maybe Carrie, if you could tell us a little bit about what what are the different methods you have to communicate. So. Uh, communication in a cave can be a lot different than above ground rescue. Um, our radios that we would normally have in the fire service, they just don't work underground. Um, they Even on the site to site channel, you're not going to make it very far underground. And so a lot of times in cave rescue, we use uh, the military phones that you see in the old movies. And so uh, there's a few different varieties, but we have a comms team in our ICS makeup. And that comms team is responsible for running that wire and setting up phone stations. Um, we also, when you first start a rescue, that needs to be one of the first teams that gets set up to be able to start those comms because the really big thing is that most 
incident commanders that start a rescue are pretty used to getting updates pretty quickly, especially with radio access. But in cave rescue, um, I know a couple of the rescues around here, the first person who really has cave rescue training looks at the IC who may not be a special operations uh, person yet, looks at him and says, okay, uh, so I'm going to go in and I'll talk to you in two hours. And that's a really big wake up call for a lot of incident commanders in the, in the fire service. And, uh, and then there ha usually is an explanation after that. Um, but when we first set up until the comm wires run, we use runners. And so your search team, if they find a patient may have to travel as far back as they went in, which could be hours in to be able to make that con uh, contact. And so a lot of our strategies and tactics are based off of the lack of communication that we have. We have some additional ICS positions. We have an under underground branch director that has a lot of autonomy underground. Um, and so they are the person in charge underground. Um, and we have that position because of our lack of communications. Um, in addition, once comms are set up, that person is also responsible for making sure that the IC is updated um, and aware of the progress of the rescue so that they can keep track above ground and um, monitor progress so that way they can take over the rescue once we get to the entrance, especially if there's an additional transport to an ambulance or to a hospital. So it sounds like one of the... Uh couple desirable characteristics for an IC of a cave incident would be patience and not being a, uh, uh, a real hands-on type IC. Yeah? <laughs> uh, that and then also the training aspects. I know at our South Central Regional uh, training that we have every year, uh, we have a command and control class. And a lot of what that's about is, hey, you're in charge of a cave rescue. Here's some practice and here's some strategies and tactics to go along with that. Here's how that you can understand what's going to happen ahead of time. Um, and that can be really valuable for the leadership in this area. Yeah, it, uh, it sounds like definitely uh, you know, a whole new set of challenges for, you know, a lot of, you know, traditional like fire service or rescue teams there where you're completely out of communication with your team for hours on end. It is. In addition, you also have a subject matter expert command structure occasionally because not everyone has the cave rescue training or has um, a lot of the cave rescue training. Like for instance, um, I'm a specialist, which at Austin Fire Department means driver um, on a fire engine. Um, but I have, I, I'm an NCRC instructor and I'm considered a subject matter expert in this. Um, and so that's not a traditionally uh, higher up ICS position kind of role. Um, but in this in this uh, kind of rescue, it, you may have to have some flexibility on chain of command to be able to put people in key positions where they'll be able to do the most good. Yeah, and that makes sense. I would imagine. So once we've established comms and and uh, you know you've you've gotten to your patient, and again, just looking at this from the outside, uh, patient packaging or movement of patients has to be a huge challenge. So you know, Andy, can you kind of? Tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how, you know, what are your, your different ways you go about taking care of the patients here? Sure. Yeah. We like to remember that uh, cave rescue is a technical response to a medical emergency and it's easy to get caught up in being in a rescue. And if you ever get confused, just take it back to what's right for the patient medically right now. And one thing that's true across the board is what's right for a patient in a cave is the rest of their life is outside of the cave. And so we've got to get them out. And we subscribe to the philosophy that the best thing we can do is to get that person out of the cave as quickly and as safely as possible, uh, hopefully in at least a good, as good of condition as, as what we found them in. And one thing that we're always up against is the danger of hypothermia. And there's there's really not a cave rescue patient who doesn't have some issue with hypothermia. We've talked about caves already just in this discussion that are in the 30s. So obviously that's really cold and you can get cold really fast. But even what we would consider a warm cave in the 60s or 70s Fahrenheit, that's still much cooler than your body temperature. And caves have wind and the conduction through the rock. There's just a whole lot of ways for you to lose heat. Um, so we spend as much time in training on hypothermia issues as we do on all of the rest of medical. Um, and in the 
in a very cold environment, like in the Rocky Mountains, we don't have a lot of time to deal with that. And somebody breaks a leg or an arm, it's usually not appropriate for us to tell that person, okay, sit here, we're going to go get help. Uh, because it might be several hours to the entrance, might be another hour to where you can get a cell phone signal, and then everyone coming to help has those hours stacked up against them as well. So uh, in many cases, our injuries underground are going to be to the extremities, to the lower legs or the, the smaller bones in the arm. And we found that the majority of these uh, injuries can be evacuated using a small party assisted technique where the patient packaging in that case is just going to be packaging and stabilization for the actual injury, like some sort of usable splint. And then the way we keep the patient warm is to keep that patient moving and helping to enact their own rescue. Uh, obviously, that's our goal um, and or our preference, but there are injuries, of course, uh, an unconscious patient, pelvic injuries, femur a fracture, those sorts of things, um, that, that person is going to have to go out in some sort of rigid litter. And once you, once you move to uh, an immobilized patient, then we're talking about extended evacuation times. Uh, much more effort has to be put into keeping this patient warm and uh, keeping their morale as high as possible. And then you're looking at, uh, in most cases, dozens of people and and many hours to, to move this patient to the entrance. And I can jump in and speak to that. Within the last 10 years here in the Southeast, uh, we've had two uh, major rescues of two indi uh, separate individuals, separate rescues. One was a uh, compound femur fracture, and one was a pelvic fracture that Andy spoke of. The, and those were two uh, true medical emergencies, and both of them were in uh, deep caves that required uh, hundreds of feet of rope work and technical raising systems to remove these two individuals from their place of injury. And both of them had a hundred people underground working on this for over 30 hours. Um, so depending on the, 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 the severity of the injury, the patient is going to have to be mobilized. And uh, you can imagine a, a patient being uh, lashed into a rigid litter for 30 something hours is that that can start creating its own set of medical medical issues for that patient. So it's real common for uh, for for cave rescue teams to use a full body vacuum splints, you know, to to, to try to help mo immobilize that patient and also to uh, to give them as much comfort as we possibly can. Uh, my team here in Chattanooga is very fortunate that we have uh, uh, we're an ALS provider, and our paramedics have standing orders from our medical director to be able to uh, per perform uh, some pretty uh, phenomenal feats underground. And without that level of uh, medical care, both of those patients would have died before we could have uh, removed them from, from the environment. Uh, one of them uh, was actually administered a unit of whole blood uh, in a stream crawl that was only... Uh, three and a half feet tall with about six inches of water running through it. Uh, and the runner made uh, delivery of that unit of plasma in with only minutes to spare before it expired. So that's kind of the level. Uh, I guess if you get hurt really severe, you need to get hurt in an in a area in tag where Chattanooga can come help you. <laughs> well, I'd imagine too, just the, you know, like you, you know, mentioned the, you know, the femur fracture and, you know, or you know, a compound femur fracture, and then also the the pelvic. I mean, pain management is for a thirty hour extrication has to be a, a, a pretty major concern. It, re it really is, and uh, like I said, we're you know we're we're fortunate to have some really strong, uh, fit paramedics that are you know they're not just they're not just paramedics, but they're uh, uh, incredible world class rock climbers, incredible cavers who are you know uber fit, and uh, they're able oftentimes to you know stay with that patient for the entire duration. Oh, that's great. So what are, what are uh, some of the, like, kind of the go-to devices if you do have to immobilize them? What, what are you looking at as what works best in most cases? Well, it, here, in the, here in North America, it's really common uh, for cave rescue teams to kind of their go-to is a, is a sked stretcher. Obviously, you know, being small and compact to get into a situation and, and small and compact to maneuver. Uh, so the sked's really popular. The, uh, the dragon lift has become also a, a popular device. 
And we often use the uh, Furno uh, Washington Model 71, the orange plastic stretcher, uh, because unlike a, a wire basket or, a, or some other kind of that we might use in an industrial fire service rescue, all three of these devices easily move through, uh, through, through the passage. And it may be common for us to uh, put a patient, their package in a skid. We move them through the confined space area of a passage. And now we're in big walking passage. So we'll put them into the rigid litter, which is easier for the rescuers to handle. Also more comfortable for the patient. They may be moved for, you know, hundreds of feet or, or some great distance in big booming passage, big open area where again they're going then they're unpackaged and back into the there we just take them out of the uh ferno and keep them in the skid and move them through the confined space again so it's a lot of a uh, uh back and forth type maneuvers yeah so become patient packaging pros there huh? we do we are yeah <laughs> the other thing that can be quite a bit different is um if you do end up having to put them in the litter uh especially the ferno style litter you may end up having to lash them in quite a bit of a different way because our patients can end up, depending on where you're trying to fit them through, they may end up on their side, they may end up head down, um, they may end up at like a 13.5 degree angle with their nose two inches off of the ceiling and being ridden over somebody's back. Um, and so our lashing can be, the goals of our lashing are a lot more you know, don't let your patient slide out in whatever way, making sure that they're comfortable. Um, Tim talked about um, long, long uh, transport times. And so making sure like, you know, most rescue companies talk about some sort of padding to make your patient comfortable. Well, for ours, that's a necessity because over time, our padding is going to compress. We have to think about the contingencies of how are we going to manage this patient's um, biological functions over time. Um, and so a lot of pre-planning ends up going into our, pre our packaging. Um, and then in addition, we also talked about the hypothermia aspects of it. And so there's sort of a thermal vapor barrier that goes th through there. Um, the difference between Tim's caves and mine is that my thermal vapor barriers are going to be a lot lighter um, depending on the condition of my patient. If they're going into, sh if they're showing signs of shock, if they're doing what I consider internal hypothermia, then they may need more. But I also don't want to cook my patient for seven hours as we move through a cave. And in the temperature of my caves, that's possible with the have sort of traditional heavy woolen blankets, heavy tarps that are used. Yeah, and, and in this region, if it is a long evacuation time, we're going to package them in basically a, a, a burrito. And they we may put a cath, or a, a cath in because we don't want to take that vapor barrier off. We have specialized uh, extensions for a uh, uh, IV uh, for uh, blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes so that, you know, they're, they're external access to the, to the patient. So we're not having to open them up and uh, let that, that the, you know, the cold air in the warm air out. So there's a lot of little tricks that we've developed over the, over the years to help maintain that uh, warding off the hypothermia. Things we don't think about in, on the, the surface where we just scoop and go. And, and then I would imagine, too, that you have to, with your patient packaging methodologies to try to keep them, you know, not only warm, but dry when you're dealing with water. That's got to be challenging. Good old uh, blue tarps that you would use to uh, over your, your wood pile or to patch your roof is a, is a go-to for us. Really? Wow. Yeah, usually, as, as with most, most things, right? Low-tech is best, right? Yeah, we actually use the same black plastic that we use for salvage covers. So what other types of specialized uh, equipment or, you know, what, or kind of what are your go-to as far as uh, equipment for systems and such? So, you know, maybe Justin, if you could take that. Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think of it less in terms of specialized, uh, more simplified. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's out there now, the clutches and the MPDs and things like that. Um, just imagine covering that in mud and then letting that mud dry and then getting that wet and then covering that in mud again and letting that dry and then see how well it works. Uh, another good example would be traditional Prusix, um, not so hot on, on, on slippery, wet, wet, muddy, dirty ropes. Um, so as far as specialized equipment goes, it's really, really simple and what you can be self-sufficient with. Uh, cave Rescue really revolves around being able to rig from your harness uh, with the gear you have, 
you might not carry a whole lot of specialized team gear into a cave or a mine um, to perform a rescue. You really have to be um, well versed in the equipment that you have. And NCRCs really um, move towards the spar um, training, uh, the small party stuff that Andy was talking about earlier, and and really digging into that. Um, a lot of tooth devices, like I said, on muddy ropes, uh, you think of handle descenders and crolls and ascending systems, and how do you turn those systems into your mechanical advantage system, um, where you can actually grip the rope with those devices uh, using munters and modified munters, super munters, things like that for lowers, uh, rather than having some some specialized device for it. A lot of times in cave rescue, um, we we touched on the command structure a little bit, but it's it's not uncommon for six to a dozen rescuers to become just strewn out across a, a, a cave for, for hundreds, if not thousands of feet. And every little obstacle, 10 foot wall that you have to get up and over or around um, becomes its own technical rescue. And the couple of guys that are there with whatever equipment they have have to figure that out. Uh, so you can end up with gear all over the place and you end up having to be extremely self-sufficient uh, one of the big focuses in SPAR is is um, counterbalance or counterweight and using your own weight and your own body weight to maneuver uh, litters and uh, up and over obstacles rather than using mechanical advantage systems because it takes up less room um, and a lot less gear uh, to make happen. So that's a, that's a really, really big focus in a lot of cave rescue training as well. Um, that's that's kind of the big stuff. I mean, we touched on on breathing apparatuses. We touched on on cave phones and some of the other calm stuff that's specialized as well. Um, if you think in terms of backcountry and and mountain rescue, um, it's not that much different. You want to be as light and fast as humanly possible because that that speed is care and getting that person out of the the cave is your prime objective. Um, so. So yeah, I think you could you could draw a lot of comparisons to to a lot of backcountry mountain teams as well. Yeah, that would make sense. I can build on that a little bit just to say uh, in the spar courses, we try to encourage the students to think about their gear critically and think about what what can you use this gear for. So as Justin was saying, it's not so much specialized. It's that carabiner. Do you have? Is it just for one certain thing or can you use it for several different things? And so an example would be we try to encourage people to carry oval shaped or pear shaped carabiners because they can be used for motor hitches. They accept the wide range of pulleys that people have, where if you're carrying something with a sharp corner, um, it, it might only have one use and not be able to be able to use for all those different uh, aspects. And so we're looking for versatility. And the best, the, the best piece of rescue gear is your brain. And as you know how to use it, um, the, the opportunities kind of just open up. And so we don't typically have this one big heavy widget on our harness that can only be used for one thing. Uh, but most of these counterweight techniques and, and minimal rescuer, or minimal gear techniques can be built with just one or two pulleys maybe a ratchet pulley, like a micro traction or something like that. Um, if you've got two or three oval shaped carabiners and a pressic loop and a tib lock, and what if I have that and Justin has that and Tim has that and Carrie has that, um, that's the real uh, rescue cash for a cave rescue. So even if you bring the big trailer to the cave entrance, it's all got to get carried in on people and in very small uh, packs. And so we're, we're trying to develop a mindset of everyone just carrying their own spar kit. And it doesn't even really have to be complete because you're going to be caving with a team and it's becoming more common to see a team of recreational cavers or expedition cavers just to have a little safety briefing before they go in the cave. And it's like, well, who's got medical training and who's got a pulley and who's got a extra rope grab 
And so you, you sort of have this awareness of, okay, this is our rescue kit for, for the day. Would it, so would it be safe to assume, especially with all the, the hauling and lowering that you're doing with these patients, that, that you're basically just using taglines on them? You're not, would it be safe to assume very seldom would you have a tender with that patient? It depends. A, a lot of the counterweight techniques, the person operating the system is right there with the patient. And so it gets back to that jack of all trades like mm-hmm. you know can't can you chew gum and climb rope at the same time so you have to have <laughs> your your caving skills down to where their muscle memory to add on you know the very complex task of also uh, dealing with a patient but in many cases that single rescuer that's operating the system is not at the top of the pitch or the bottom uh, they're actually suspended in the pitch with the patient and so we can get uh, both both jobs done by one person, ideally. I would say if we're doing the more traditional, you know, what we think about, you know, a patient package in a, in a, in a litter being lifted or hauled, we're just like what Andy said, but no, we're, we're not, even if they're packaged, we're typically not going to have a traditional litter attendant on the load with the patient. They're going, because we're cavers, we're proficient in ascending and descending in our single rope techniques. So we're, we may be if if a team is lifting the patient, then there may be a rescuer ascending their own set of their own rope adjacent to the patient. But we, I would say, it's it's rare in cave rescue that we're going to be lifting a two person load. Uh, there's a an unintended positive consequence to that too, because a lot of the the talk and a lot of the the stigmatism out there about using tooth devices um, when you half your load and you're just using the load of that one person is all that's on that line, a lot of those concerns go away. I think if there's anything the rescue, technical rescue community at large could take away from cave rescuers, it's the ability to move on rope, um, the ability to to move yourself around vertically on rope um, is just not as important in all of the other rescue disciplines as it is in caves. And until you get into that situation where you have to do it, uh, you don't realize how valuable it can really be. And then heaven forbid something goes wrong and now you're rescuing not only your patient, but someone on your team, the ability to move on rope becomes absolutely invaluable. I agree. Um, A lot of the vertically proficient cavers I know, the skills that they have in cave are not just for moving straight up and down a rope. They move sideways through the air in a way that looks, let's just say that my sprat level one was a lot easier because I'd already done all of that stuff on one rope before. And so in a little hole in the ground, (laughs) well, in some trees, but, um, and in a little hole, large hole in the ground, but the, the vertical proficiency of, of those vertical cavers is not just, you know, up, down, the way that we practice. Um, and then in addition, the other thing I wanted to talk about was that critical thinking aspect that Andy touched on is one of the most important things that we get out of this cave rescue training. The I, I recommend almost universally that people go to cave rescue training, and it's not because I go on cave rescues every week. I don't. But... What I get from NCRC is the critical thinking aspects where I learned that the environment that I am may dictate or that I'm in may dictate the kind of rescue techniques that I can pull from. And because I end up having a much varied, much more varied bunch of techniques to choose from, um, then I have, you know, the, the right tool for the job that I have in front of me, whether that's, you know, a big tag pit or, this crawly little section or a 10 foot wall or having to go sort of diagonally sideways through um, a passage um, to get to the next level in a cave. And I think that being able to see those aspects and then know the thing, the Rolodex through the things that I've got available to me, what equipment does everyone have on them? That's super invaluable. And even if you didn't have caves in your area, the rigging and the critical thinking aspects that you learn in a cave are going to be translatable to any kind of rescue that you do. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of forethought that goes into what gear everyone has on them at all times. Doesn't say from listening to you, it doesn't sound like anything is by accident. No, and I think a lot of that comes from that expedition caver mindset of 
you know, if you picture and not necessarily even expedition, but let's say a deep multi drop cave where you've got a small team of people, you might have seven or 10 different pitches to rig and you've got to carry all that stuff and rig it on the way in and de-rig it on the way out. Well, that's a lot of stuff and it's, it's very physically demanding. And so you quickly get out of the habit of using a webbing sling and a carabiner and another little piece of metal on every single rig. You're going to look for the simplest, most efficient way to do that. And the webbing and carabiners that you leave behind, like say on the surface pitch, um, may be extremely valuable eight hours later when there's a rescue situation down below. So to me, it all just flows from that mindset of, it's a small team. We're in the wilderness, um, whatever the wilderness may actually be, but, um, you're off by yourself and your decisions have consequences. And, uh, there's a real, um, skill to that about how to efficiently move people and gear in and out of a cave. And unlike some other sports, um, there's not really a definite leader and everyone else is a follower. It's, it's a team effort. And, I've seen in caving more than any anything else I do. There's a real effort to say, "Hey, I rigged this, but everybody come look at it. You know, let's let's see what you think." And the least experienced person on the team has just as much uh, responsibility to check that rigging and speak up as anyone else. And so we're we're striving for kind of an equal competency across the board. And I really appreciate uh, that mindset flowing over into rescue as well. Yeah, that that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. The uh, Early on, I think uh, one of you mentioned that kind of your preferred method or one of your preferred methods of moving somebody you know, up is a counterbalance method. And if you're not able to do that, that, that counterbalance or the counterweight, what uh, what would your preferred methods be to get these people out of these you know, 500 and 700 foot deep pits? Wow. You know, in, in the beginning, I think it was the siege tactic uh, as a term that we've used, you know, where uh, it was, you know, large rigging teams. Uh, and we, we actually find right the opposite of that, that uh, oftentimes there's, there's not room for, you know, a, a six or eight person haul team at, at the top of the pit. Uh, so it's usually right the opposite, doing some kind of counterweighted system, whether that's, you know, uh, the rescuer goes down and the patient comes up or whether that's a system where the rescuer is with the patient and they're, they're, they're basically climbing them out with a, with a system on the ropes. Uh, hmm. That might be another method trying to, you know, to that the, the rescuers is basically using a, an inchworm or a piggyback system uh, where they're lifting the patient on a fixed line. Uh, so still, it, it's it's we're trying to move away from those uh, siege tactics where what we would normally see in, in the fire service or traditional rescue, where there's a, a big haul team at the top of a, a bluff or a top of a pitch. Yeah, I would I would imagine we could almost make an entire podcast on just the uh, the preferred techniques used uh, for both ascend and descending, lowering and raising of the patients. So, oh yeah, I think we could I think we, we could all geek out on that for a while. <laughs> So, and, and I have to ask, because uh, just out of curiosity, you know, looking at, you know, you, you, would you look at a map of a cave or something like that, how in the heck do you guys navigate underground? That, that to me is just mind boggling, how you, how you know where you're at in a cave. Well, it, it all comes from the idea that the most important thing to do on a cave trip is to get out of the cave, right? So you have to develop techniques that allow you to do that. And in a complex cave, you can't rely on people's memory of it. And so cave mapping was developed hundreds of years ago and continues to evolve and become more sophisticated. But essentially when you see a map of a cave that's a hundred miles long, you're looking at the effort of tens of thousands of hours of people measuring with tapes and lasers and compasses. And um, we could talk for hours about that as well, but essentially the map is the main tool for understanding the cave, knowing where it goes, how to navigate through it. Um, some really uh, extensive caves have systems of tape trails that are like highways that allow you to kind of um, use it like an interstate system and you don't have to look at the map every five minutes. But essentially anyone that goes into a cave has to have a system for getting back out and that can uh, apply to, you know, search teams sent into a cave. 
Uh, you, you might have a map of some sort of quality, but at some point you might find yourself off the map. And so you need to be able to turn around and look at what the cave is going to look like on the way out. They say there's two caves, the one that you see on the way in and the one that you see on the way out. And people have become lost literally for days in some cases because they went through a little hole into a room and took off. And then on the way back, they realized there's not just one little hole, there's five little holes. And so probably a skill that most cavers develop pretty quickly is that of turning around and looking at what the cave will look like on the way out. If it's very complex, you could leave a little piece of reflective tape or something like that that you pick up on the way out or just a little stack of rocks. We try not to leave permanent uh, route finding stuff like that. Like if you've ever been in a cave where people think it's a good idea to run string, uh, you'll, you won't want to do that anymore. Um, but essentially you have to get out of the cave. So whether it's a map or a trail system or just using good judgment, uh, that's definitely a priority. Yeah, that's interesting how you, how you do that. Like I said, I, when, in our pre-conversation, we talked a little bit about this and I, I found it fascinating after looking at the, uh, uh, some of the maps, these things are definitely nothing like a highway map. That's for sure. Or a trail map. So one of the things that uh, a couple of you have mentioned here is the NCRC. So uh, maybe Andy, could you tell us a little bit more about what the NCRC is and then you know what 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 can that uh, you know what do you offer? Sure, the NCRC is a commission, the National Cave Rescue Commission of the National Speleological Society, and it was created in the late seventies uh, to help uh, kind of put forward cave rescue curriculum, get cavers and professional rescuers working together on these incidents because you have this specialized group of people, cavers that know how to get around in a cave and it's like a second home to them. And those cavers might not have any rescue abilities or skills. And then you have this professional rescue community of search and rescue teams and firefighters and others that are really good at rescuing people, but might be terrified to go in a cave or just not know how to do it or have the proper gear. So what we do is we offer trainings and we have several different offerings. Uh, we have week long classes, level one, which teaches you to be a cave rescue team member. Level two teaches you to be a, a cave rescue team leader. Um, and then cave rescue specialists, which would be the level three class. And we have, um, and those are, you know, scored classes with tests and checkoffs and things of that nature. So we can give out a certificate but we also have weekend classes like orientation to cave rescue, where we can run you through the basics of all this stuff in two days. So you can get an idea and awareness of what cave rescue is like and actually operate a military field phone underground and things like that. And then for the last uh, 10 years or so, we've had the small party assisted rescue class, the SPAR class, which is really popular with um, cavers. And we offer these things throughout the year. We have a national seminar with a bunch of classes all together. We have regional seminars like the one Carrie's referring to. That one goes every year with a level one and a level two and other classes. And then there's kind of uh, sporadic offerings throughout the country. Um, and that's the NCRC is a volunteer organization. So we all do it um, just to you know, give back to the, either the caving community, the rescue community, keep our skills sharp. Um, and then, so that's our education part of our mission. And the other thing that we do is in a real rescue, the NCRC is not a responding cave rescue team, but we have regional coordinators that can help to send the resources that you need to the cave rescue. And so we try to build uh, relationships with sheriff's departments and other agencies that have jurisdiction so that, and train with all together so that when the real rescue happens, it's not these opposing forces or strangers meeting up at the scene. It's people that have trained together and know each other and know what each other's capabilities are. And it's, it's been a vastly successful experiment. We have much better outcomes in cave rescues than we used to. And my personal view is that what we mostly do is prevent rescues by showing people what's involved. If you get hurt in a cave, <laughs> what it's going to be like to ride in a litter for four hours or, it might be as simple as a comment that an instructor makes to you about your gear. Hey, why do you have that on your harness or why do you wear your chest harness that way? And just telling the stories of how incidents happen, 
Um, the training actually serves to prevent rescues over the long haul. And so not only do we hear people come back and say, Hey, that thing you taught me, like we used it and we get to hear amazing stories like that. I think for every one of those, there's 10 or 20 stories of something that just never happened at all because uh, we're getting people squared away with the right mindset. Yeah. I think that the, some of the, that rescue mindset that we teach them goes a long way to helping them with their their own recreational trips, right? We talked a little bit about now that safety briefings sometimes are becoming part of recreational trips where it's like, hey, who has a pulley and who has medical experience? And I don't think that was quite as common before. I think in addition, so at these regional classes, especially the week longs, it's kind of like going to camp. You like you sit in and you listen to some lectures, but then you go out into caves, into cliffs and and get to practice all the things that you learn. And there's checkoffs and long days and good campfire stories at night. And then at the end, it culminates into a large mock rescue where three to six people go into a cave and all have the worst day of their lives. And then uh, you get to use all the skills that you learned all week in as real of a situation as we can make it. Um, And I think that's one of the most valuable things that we do as well. And I want to plug plug the NCRC training. It is probably if not the best value for the dollar in technical rescue training in the U.S. Although a lot of instructors are full-time technical instructors, like Andy said, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, Everybody's there of their own accord and they're paying their own way. And uh, a typical national uh, week-long seminar, which includes rooming board, is usually $600, $800 or less. So, and then regional trainings are even cheaper. So it's, it's a great, a great value. Oh, that's great. I know one of the things that we've kind of had a theme on is in, on the podcast is that, you know, we, all these, all of the different disciplines and technical rescue really need to look to each other to see what we can, you know, you know, plagiarize uh, blatantly from each other. And, you know, whether it be the caving world, arborists, rope access, uh, you know, just a, a traditional tech rescue, you know, we could all learn from each other. And, and we can all do our jobs better that way by, by learning from each other. So I'm really glad that, uh, uh, that you told us about uh, this training. That may uh, hopefully open up some new avenues and open up some eyes. So I'm kind of looking at our, uh, our clock here. We're, we're hitting that hour mark, which uh, seems to happen pretty easily when you get into you know, subjects this interesting. So, Justin, any, uh, anything to help uh, get us uh, to close out here? Uh, no, I... I think I'll just reiterate what what everybody was just talking about, and and for the rescue community at large, uh, reach out and find cavers in your area in CRC classes that you can take, uh, regardless of what your rescue discipline is. Um, um, Tim hit it right on the nose. It really is some of the best rescue training you can get, uh, relatively cheap compared to a lot of training out there. And those vertical skills and those rope skills will take you a long way. And I think it's a it's a component that's missing in a lot of rescue disciplines that people can take away from cave rescue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Andy? Well, I'll just say uh, you can learn more about the NCRC and our upcoming trainings on our website, which is ncrc.info. And you can see upcoming trainings. There's the South Central Regional coming up soon in January. I'm pretty sure it's all sold out. Uh, but we do have a national seminar scheduled for Covington, Virginia next July. And there is space available in all of those levels currently. So please check us out there. Um, and just to kind of, you know, reinforce what others said, I'm always impressed at a national seminar, how it really is the best of the best in rescue throughout the U.S. Because there's something about cave rescue that even if you don't do cave rescues all the time, you want to be there at that training and see what's new and see how people are building the thing and, and doing the stuff. Um, and they, you'll find some of the best professional rescuers and emergency managers, some of the best cavers in the world are there. It's, it's a really unique mix of people. And uh, as Carrie said, a lot of the learning happens outside the classroom and outside of the field sites, just being in that environment, cave rescue summer camp. Great. Thanks. Carrie. Uh, I think that just the same thing that everybody else is saying. I think that cave rescue, especially with a lot of the trends with um, personal vertical proficiency in rescue, um, we've been doing that for a really long time. 
Um, and then a lot of the critical thinking aspects that we've tried to incorporate into the way that we train during a week long, but even during a weekend orientation to cave rescue, you'll still do that mock and you'll still put into practice what you've been doing. And a lot of times I think that we do like small pieces of those rescues, like we'll haul someone up a cliff or we'll lower somebody down in a, you know, in a confined space environment, but putting the whole thing together, all the different teams, the ICS structure, everything like that is very invaluable for any rescue discipline that's out there. Excellent. Thanks. And Tim? Well, Doug, I just want to thank you and CMC for uh, putting on this uh, this podcast and for inviting Cave Rescue to be uh, uh, introduced maybe to a, lot, a larger audience that might not have known about NCRC and, and what Cave Rescue actually uh is and can do for them. So thank you. Uh, yeah, you're very welcome. And thank all four of you for coming on and and kind of giving all, and our listeners and myself a glimpse into the, the world of cave rescue. I think it's really fascinating. Uh, definitely uh, want to pursue a little bit more here, learn a little bit more about it. So it's, uh, uh, again, thank you. And what we'll do is on our website under uh, the CMC uh, Pro under the podcast uh, page, we'll make sure and put links into the NCRC and some of the trainings you were talking about. So hopefully we can try to connect up uh, our listeners with the resources that, uh, that you have to offer. So uh, thanks again, and uh, stay tuned for another CMC podcast.